Next up, we're very honored to have uh, Lee Jasper, who is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Aconex. Uh, Aconex is a wonderful journey uh, over more than a decade now, uh, and one of the original SaaS businesses uh, in Australia. Uh, so please, everyone, uh, welcome Lee. Thanks, Nikki. I may just uh, need a clicker. So before I jump into my slides, how many people here know what a dial-up modem is? How many people have actually used one? No, so quite a lot of you. Um, so when, when we started, um, that was what the technology was at the time. I mean, the internet was literally dial-up modems. Um, and so I'm going to wind back to the very early days of the business, back in 2000, 2001, 2002, and just go through some of the things we thought about, particularly around the business model uh, and kind of how we were evolving that in those very early days before SaaS before the word SaaS existed, uh, back then it was application service providers, uh, before anybody really knew how to charge for the thing. Uh, and so I just wanted to walk through a little bit of what we did and how we thought about the business model. See if that works. Okay. Uh, so the initial idea I'll talk to, um, how we developed the business model. Uh, I'll focus a little bit on the network effects, because uh, that was one of the key things that we recognised that as we were building out the business, um, that we needed to build and reinforce these network effects. And a few more random thoughts uh, along the way. So what do we do? Just uh, before I jump into the early days... Seems not... Oops. Uh, so just what we do. So we essentially help um, large construction projects, large infrastructure projects, manage all of their information, all of their processes. So essentially getting construction teams onto the same page, so to speak, onto the same document. Uh, giving them visibility uh, and control over who has what information when, essentially connecting up the entire project team onto a common internet platform. Uh, we work on projects ranging from small, sort of high-rise residential commercial projects in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, uh, across Australia to some of the world's largest infrastructure projects. We now have... Um, we're a public company now, so some of these numbers are a little more conservative than where we're at, but we're a bit over... Uh, around 1.5 billion documents uh, on the platform, managing nearly a trillion dollars worth of projects uh, from our 41 offices around the world. So really kind of a mini multinational that started out of Australia. About 450 staff, um, and we just listed the business uh, last uh, December on the, uh, on the Australian Stock Exchange. Just to give you a very simple example of how we work on projects, this is the Venetian uh, Hotel in Macau. Um, that's a 15,000 seat stadium. That's 3,000 hotel rooms, and those little blips up in the top right, which you can't really see, are concrete trucks arriving on the site to pour concrete. And the peak of construction, they were pouring about three... So three concrete trucks a minute were arriving on the site. So essentially what we're doing is helping the guys out on site access all the documentation, uh, log defects, manage essentially the project from either their head office, the site shed, or out on site uh, in the field. Um, basically providing a range of applications for the construction team uh, to manage all of their information and processes. It's a cloud mobile platform, uh, essentially very much focused on this industry, uh, working project-wide, so the contractor, the, the owner, all of the subcontractors, all the consultants accessing the system and working across the full project life, life cycle from bidding through design uh, and ultimately to our construction and operations. So that's what we do now. But I'll wind way, way back. And... Uh, really go through how we developed the business model. Now, the caveat I'm going to mention here is that we weren't graphic designers. Um, some of the pages you're going to see are very, very ugly, um, like this. Um, so that's what a website looked like back in 2001. Um, I sometimes wonder how we ever got off the ground with a website that looked like that. Um, we uh, really set out to build, interestingly, a B2B exchange. So back in 2000, uh, when we started, uh, we launched the project in 2001, uh, back in the late 90s, a lot of people were talking about B2B exchanges. Uh, and we thought we'd be a B2B exchange for the construction industry. Um, that's where our name came from, Australian Construction Exchange. Uh, and we essentially thought people would, you know, go and transact on the platform. Um, they'd eventually, you know, buy and sell concrete online, all those sorts of things. Um, so we essentially looked at it as a tendering system, catalogue purchasing system. We had business services and then document con control and correspondence management sitting on, obviously, the web infrastructure that we'd built. What we found was that really nobody at that point, and arguably still today, is ready to buy and sell concrete online. Um, it will happen, uh, but they certainly weren't ready to do it back in the early 2000s. So what we essentially doubled down on was uh, collaboration. I wouldn't necessarily call it a pivot. You hear a lot of people these days talk about, um, you know, pivots in terms of, you know, their business model. 
It was more of a, you know, we had these pieces um, that we thought would be necessary. We thought the collaboration would actually underpin the auctions we were going to do, the procurement exchange we were going to build. Uh, what we found is people weren't really ready for that. Um, so what we did was focus all our attention on the collaboration piece. So essentially helping all of our clients access and manage their information, their documents, their correspondence on the platform. Uh, the other interesting thing was that because we thought about it as a, an exchange, if you like, about you know, people buying and selling, transacting on the system, we set it up as a neutral platform. And that was something that became absolutely critical in the way we developed the business over the subsequent years, that that neutrality, that independence, meant that essentially we could service the entire project team without favouring one party over another. So sort of by accident almost, the thinking about it as a transactional hub meant that we thought about information exchanges the same way and built a platform, essentially a web-based platform, um, in those early days that gave everybody equal access to their information, gave everybody security um, and, tr and trust or, or confidence, if you like, in the way their information was going to be handled on the system. Again, our graphics weren't great then and uh, hopefully a lot better these days. Um, so we essentially built in around this um, collaboration piece um, and really thought about how it was going to change the way the industry worked together. And particularly, you know, moving from everybody having their own system. So back then, still today, uh, in a lot of projects, a lot of area, you know, a lot of regions around the world, people manage projects either in hard copy or perhaps with systems, but those systems are very much focused around their business. What we were doing was moving to a common platform where you'd have multiplex, uh, you'd have the owner, might be a stock land, then you have all the subcontractors and consultants all built in, or all using the same platform, all connected into the same platform. The other thing we did back then, again, because of this thinking about it as an exchange, everybody essentially logged in once. So if you were a subcontractor working with Multiplex or Grocon or Hanson Yunkin, you just logged into the platform once. Um, so very much kind of a Facebook-style model, but for the construction sector for our industry. Um, the other thing was that we really had to focus in around how we were going to get people onto the platform. So if we're going to build this collaboration platform, we then had to think about how do we move people from a very traditional way of building to uh, a platform to manage all of their, their collaboration. And back then, you know, I'd go out to site and it wouldn't just be speaking to people about, you know, what we did. We actually had to explain almost what the internet was. So I'd go into construction sites and it was like, OK, I kind of, kind of get what you guys do. What's the internet? Why would I need that? And we literally had projects that would go from no computers on site to putting a computer in, getting their trusty dial-up modem or maybe ADSL uh, a year or two later and connecting onto the platform uh, through, you know, through, through whatever they could get at the time. And thankfully, you know, over the years, um, we rode that broadband wave. Um, and frankly, without broadband, we wouldn't have made it. Uh, without the speeding up of the internet, uh, without it getting faster, eventually, we, you know, we probably wouldn't have made it. The other very interesting thing about the early days was that back then, it cost about a million dollars for a terabyte of data. Um, so <laughs> you imagine where we would have been if it still cost a million dollars for a terabyte of data. Um, we have hundreds of terabytes, thousands of terabytes on the system today, so we just simply wouldn't have made it if data stayed uh, the same price as what it, what it was back then. Actually, picking up on some of Steve's comments, we almost had to build everything. Um, so there's no AWS, there was no way you could host it with all the services provided, so we literally built our own stack. Um, so we'd go into a data centre, we'd co-locate, uh, so we didn't build the data centre, but we'd ra rent racks, uh, and then we'd go and put in all of our servers, uh, and then we'd run the applications. Uh, we became very good at that. Um, it's only now that we, I mean, we still have run a lot of our data, own data centres on a co-located basis. It's only in the last year or two that it's been more cost effective for us to move to external providers who do more of those services for us. Um, the other interesting thing about uh, that, of course, is that because we're doing everything, there were a few screw-ups along the way. Um, I remember Rob, the other co-founder, uh, we had a set of servers in London. We have multiple instances around the world, and he would literally move, if we needed to move data centre, he'd you know, rent a car, um, he was in London, so he didn't have a, his own car, rent a car for the day or for the night, and we'd load up the servers and move them from one data centre to another, um, trying to get some sort of failover, but essentially just moving the whole instance into another data centre. And Rob was reinstalling it, um, putting all the servers in, and one of the guys said, whatever you do, don't pull out that cable, just as Rob pulls out the cable and takes down our system for the, literally for the next 12 hours. So um, very tough and very different to today where you can, you know, spin it up on AWS and a lot easier. Um, the other big thing for us in the early days was thinking about it, what's the model going to be? So how are we going to price this service? Um, how do we think about pricing a service that nobody's ever used before? And we weren't coming in and replacing something. We were essentially completely greenfields, building a service, a system that people didn't have before. 
Um, one of our really bad ideas was that we thought we'd charge per, you know, per thing you did on the system, that you could, you know, we'd charge you per document you put up, um, per, um, you know, to create and send tenders, to access the systems. We'd have sort of almost like a tele, telco rate card, like your mobile phone, and you get a bill for all of your different services. When we went out to construction companies, they couldn't wrap their head around that. We couldn't necessarily explain to them how many documents they'd have. So essentially we settled in on a model that we still have today, which is an unlimited model. Where we go into a project or to a company and we'd say, it'll cost you X, uh, typically around 0.1% of a project's value, or a company's uh, workbook of projects, it'll cost you X uh, to run the, the project and to run as many people as you want onto the system. So very much focus on that unlimited model, which of course then underpinned the way we were driving collaboration on the system. Uh, so it was all around getting more people on, pricing in a way that didn't discourage extra users, extra companies from coming on to the system. Uh, and we also thought a lot about what the business model looked like. Um, and again, this has changed a little bit, but very early, again, it was all around collaboration content, which it still is today. Uh, the commerce element we don't do today, but eventually we will. Um, it's just when the industry is ready to buy and sell online, we'll be ready for them. Uh, they're not quite there yet. But the key thing was that independence. Having an independent platform that was neutral really underpinned the way we were able to grow the business over the years. And that was back in mid-2000. So we essentially took mid-2002, so it took really a year or so of working with our customers, getting the first deals, going out and speaking to people. Um, I remember actually one of our clients, I was in, uh, we were in, in Melbourne, I was in the car down to Geelong and negotiating with a client, having no idea that we, I probably overpriced it frankly, but being confident enough to put a price out there and stick to it and say to the, it was Hanson Youngkin, say look it's going to be 70 grand for the project. Um, and uh, you know, getting a deal like that where you're just sort of throwing a number out there and trying to determine where value is, but then continually refining the business model based on every client you work with. Uh, we also learned that it had to be, this is again a, an early slide from back in uh, 2002, I think, uh, that we essentially had to bring people onto this common network. So as I said before, we thought a lot around the network effects and how we drive that, how we encourage network effects across the business. So we essentially designed the model to do that. And again, a lot of these elements are still here today. Uh, what we thought back then was that we had to get both the head contractors and the subs and also the suppliers and then the consultants, um, which aren't on this chart, but get them all interacting in this multi-sided market. Uh, I mentioned some of the clients. Um, one of the key things we had to do or we, that really helped us was getting key nodes in the network. So getting the key contractors, the key owners that would drive other people onto the system. So we really, really thought a lot about who were going to be those key customers that would underpin our growth. And companies like Multiplex, uh, Grocon, uh, ProBuild, those sorts of companies really helped us build and build the network and get out into the market. Uh, but what it meant also was we priced aggressively to get them. Uh, so where there's somebody who's going to really drive your business, drive your, drive your uptake of the network, um, those key influencers, we uh, encouraged them to get onto the system early. Uh, so essentially the, 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 the three key areas that we had um, and we determined in those early years was that we had to have this unlimited model uh, that as many companies as needed, as many users as needed to could come onto the platform and all interact over the platform. Uh, we wanted it to be neutral, it had to be neutral uh, to drive this network effect and importantly it had to be scalable. So as we added more and more companies to the system, it had to scale up. Uh, and of course the great thing about the internet is you've essentially got built in scalability, even doing it ourselves. Yeah, occasionally you'd have to add a you know, new block of hardware, a new block of servers, but once you, you know, did that step change, you essentially had complete scalability uh, until you hit the next point. These days, of course, with AWS and other services, other hosting services out there, you've got essentially complete scalability. You can just keep adding capacity as you need to. Uh, so for us, adding an incremental user essentially cost us nothing. Uh, we had to, of course, train them, but from a technical point of view, there weren't any significant costs in adding an additional user. Um, and so that's one of the things I'd always look for in a business, is how you can scale it and drive, you know, as, as you're getting 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 million users, how do you scale up? Um, how are you able to do that? Uh, and of course, most internet businesses have that built into them. I won't touch on too much of the detail here other than all these elements of, the, of network effects drove our strategic decisions. So at each point along the way, we thought about how we could drive the network. Um, we recognised that ultimately it was a winner-takes-all market. Uh, so it meant that we were playing the long game all the way along, uh, getting key influ influences in that would help us build the network. Um, really focusing on those, engaging those key influences. Uh, and then um, essentially working out how we could build collective switching costs into the model. So as we got more and more people onto the system, it was harder then for people to switch off uh, over time. So it's been a very powerful thing that as we get clients on, they, it becomes very sticky. 
uh, and then it's very hard for them if they wanted to move somewhere else because their entire network is set up on Aconex. We're, of course, doing that in a good way in the sense that we uh, are driving value for them and making sure that we're always putting the customer first, but ultimately we've built in really strong switching costs into our model. Uh, and also looking at how we can build the links and drive stronger linkages between all the companies on the platform. So deeper processes, uh, yeah, the most important processes that these guys have to run on their construction projects, we want to help them drive them much more efficiently. So what does that look like? Um, this is from recently, um, but you, you see projects that look like that, uh, where you get hundreds, sometimes thousands of companies all connected up on the network. Uh, so that's for one project. And then across the network, you end up with uh, this sort of effect, where you have companies that are working on dozens, uh, sometimes hundreds of projects on the system. All their supply, supply chain is all enabled on the platform, uh, and they're essentially connecting across, uh, sometimes, again, thousands uh, of companies using the Aconex network. And what you can see here is uh, this is for one contractor, one global contractor. Uh, it's clusters of projects in different regions uh, and with different and potentially different verticals that they're working on. So it might be uh, one, you know, one of those clusters maybe around oil and gas or around infrastructure or potentially commercial construction. Um, one of the things that we really like about network effects, and I always look for when I invest in businesses, is um, they just have really powerful, uh, generate really powerful scale and returns over time. So as you drive those network effects, and of course we all know with the social networks, um, there's other types of networks out there that have these really strong network effects, and the winner or the winners are able to drive really significant <coughs> returns. Uh, very high profitability over time, uh, and that scalability essentially kicks in so that they, they end up with as very high margin businesses. It doesn't necessarily start that way, and that's one of the things that we've found uh, as a public company, obviously educating people as to how networks build over time. Um, they take time to build, uh, but then once you get to a tipping point, they become uh, you know, hugely profitable. Uh, a couple of... Uh, I do read books. I think Steve doesn't. I do read a few books um, occasionally. Um, a great book, for those of you who hadn't read it, is Good to Great. Uh, and one of the things they talk about, or Jim Collins talks about it, is this hedgehog concept. And we do believe in that, um, that you, know, you need to get... To be a successful business, you need to be deeply passionate about what you're doing. You need to fundamentally be able to be the best in the world at what you do. Uh, and we, well, while we started in Australia, we believed we could be the best in the world at what we do. We now lead our market internationally. But it has to make money. Um, and that's the thing often you know, people uh, maybe look past. Um, and networks are great ways of making money. Um, if you can get to the point where your network's locked in, um, again, you get those very strong returns and uh, you can generate really significant profitability. Um, one thing I'd say here is a product is not a business. Um, I often I'll hear a lot of people talking about the importance of the product, um, and that's true. Products are really important. You have to get your product right. But if you have the right product and the wrong business model, you won't be successful. I'd argue even if your product isn't perfect, if you've got the right business model, you can potentially push past some of those product limitations. I don't think we necessarily had the best product. We had a good product. Um, it was probably one of the top products in the market. I don't necessarily think we had the best product, but what we have, I think, and we still have today is the best business model um, in our market. And that was that focus on that unlimited nature, you know, that unlimited service, um, the unlimited number of users, uh, bringing them onto the platform. Uh, lastly, again, um, you know, in terms of thinking about business models, um, a lot of ways to do it, but there's a few things I look for and I think are really important. Scalability, I mentioned. Defensibility. Uh, so if you can lock in, if you're a network-style business, lock in collective switching costs, but have a very defensible model. Um, it can be capital light and also um, love businesses that have network effects in them. And, uh, if you can find a business that does, um, get in behind it. I think they can be hugely uh, you know, profitable over time. Doesn't mean it'll be easy in the first few years, uh, but there's you know, huge returns for the winner if you can be that winner. And then lastly, just a couple more thoughts. Um, one of the things we did along the way, um, we were very focused on not in hiring people without egos, uh, really hiring people that were very humble. Uh, if you... Frankly, if you don't hire humble people, you're going to be arguing about things. Um, humble, people who aren't humble often don't listen to the customer. Um, so we thought it was really important to get humble people into the business and to act in a humble way uh, in relation to our clients. The other thing is, um, one of the best things I was... Uh, somebody uh, helped me on in the early years was learning how to sell. Now, some businesses don't necessarily need a lot of salespeople. Um, that's fine. Then you need to learn how to market. Uh, in our case, we're selling to the construction sector, we're selling to an industry, so I had to learn how to sell. And frankly, it was the hardest six months I ever had was the first six months that I was out there selling. Um, I had to learn what to do, I had to learn how to engage with customers, how to listen, uh, and it was a tough six months, but ultimately underpinned uh, what we were able to do with the business over time. 
I also say go global early. Um, you don't, Australia's a small market. The earlier you can get global, um, the better. It doesn't have to be the US. Uh, we didn't go to the US until about six or seven years ago. We started in Asia, we started in the Middle East where there are big construction markets. So depending on your, you know, whatever your business is, um, whichever market you're serving, uh, I'd say you don't have to go to the US. Often people assume you do. Um, it's a great market, but not necessarily the best market as a first step out from Australia. Um, purpose, vision and value is really important. We set about defining our purpose and our vision and codifying our values pretty early on, uh, and we kept those over time. Uh, I won't go into them specifically, but uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, and again, just coming back to that um, approach on a business, uh, it's really important that you design that business model up front. So that's a little bit about, a little bit about our journey. Um, happy to take questions. Take a seat. I wanted to start with the, uh, the initial vision of Aconex being a, a marketplace or selling concrete online. How did you figure out that wasn't going to work? What kinds of ex expectations did you have in the early days and, and what were the, the feedback points where you thought, okay, now's the time to shut this part of the product down? Yeah, so essentially we went out to customers and that's how we found out about it. So we, we, we had this idea, this idea for this exchange, uh, this network we're going to build, a marketplace if you like. And as we went out and started speaking to clients, they, they sort of look at that and go, okay, yeah, that's interesting. You talk to me about this collaboration piece. Uh, so what we found was simply in those early engagements, we repeatedly had our clients saying to us, our customers saying, or potential customers, these weren't even customers at this point, saying, oh, yeah, I'm not sure I'm quite ready for that, but this collaboration piece. So essentially we iterated very quickly with our customers. Um, and uh, look, we even sold a big deal with one supplier for, uh, to enable their catalogue online. But and it was a, we actually put it on the wall because it was a big deal, but we quickly realised that people weren't ready for it. Um, so we essentially de-emphasised that, and then within a couple of years, we essentially shut it down. Um, again, not that people won't do that eventually, but certainly back in the early 2000s, people just weren't ready for it. But it was this continually iterative cycle with our customers, and as, the, as a founder, uh, so as myself and Rob as founders, uh, you know, I was out there, Rob as well, but we were out there talking to customers continually, and as a founder, I think that's absolutely important that you understand your customers, um, whether that's you know, through analytics, um, in case you, know, you might have a web-based product that you don't need to be out there speaking to customers, but, but then you need to understand the data. In our case, we could speak directly to the customers and, and understand what they needed directly from them. And, and um, obviously, the, the benefit of this customer development process, did you actually build uh, the product or the software? Did you actually have concrete sales online or was... Uh, lucky enough to get it early in this customer development process? So we had a, we had a product, we did have a, a catalogue, um, we had uh, people ready to go, but essentially by the time we sort of realised that it was all around the collaboration, the document control component of the system, uh, we'd essentially sort of de almost sort of de-emphasise that anyway at that point. So I don't know that we ever actually had any transactions, I, um, we might have had a few, but essentially people would go and check the catalogue, um, so there's certainly people engaging with the information, but they weren't ready to you know, hit click and um, you know, buy $50,000 worth of concrete, uh, but uh, what people were ready to do was start transacting the information. So that's where we really focused in, where, where, where people had a distinct need there and then that we could service and, and solve. And, and maybe even rewinding even earlier, how did you and Rob uh, sort of run into the problem? What, what were you doing before uh, Aconex that led you to this uh, solving this problem? Yeah, so I was at McKinsey and Company, uh, so I'd done engineering at university, uh, knew a bit about computers, because um, in engineering back then, uh, well, mechanical engineering, but we all did a bit of programming. Uh, so at McKinsey, I essentially did two years, 98, 99, 2000, in the dot-com boom, advising companies uh, on what the internet was going to do for their business, good, bad, or otherwise. I had this great exposure to what the internet was doing at the time. Uh, this is really the first dot-com boom. Um, so I was really exposed to it, and Rob was out on construction sites with Multiplex, and we started talking about could we use the internet to essentially enable the industry to make it easier for people to work together. That was really the original idea. Um, we both left our jobs, uh, so I left McKinsey, Rob left Multiplex in about April of 2000. Um, again, for those of you who are old enough, um, that wasn't such a great time to leave um, a well-paying job like McKinsey when literally the very next week um, the Nasdaq crashed. Uh, but we were somehow able to scramble through and again, we couldn't do a, 50, this wasn't a $50,000 raise where you'd go out and build a proof of concept. We would literally raise two million bucks off the, um, off the strength of a business plan. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do that today in the sense that, again, you, you can get proof of concept up and going these days, but back then we had to get people to believe that we could deliver on this vision. Um, we raised a couple of million bucks, 
yeah, when we went out to the market, started to build our product. Um, we had a piece of software that we bought. I won't mention the name of the company, but a very large um, software company um, uh, that uh, essentially sold us a piece of software that underpinned the whole site. Um, that was about a half a million dollar spend. So out of our first raise of two million bucks, half a million dollars went on the first you know, piece of software that we used to underpin the entire system. And then that particular company made a big mistake a few months later, coming back and telling us that uh, it was great for us, worked out really well for us, telling us that we're going to have to spend another half a million for, because we were using it in the production environment and we also had a dev environment, development environment, um, that we had to pay for licences for both, which we hadn't factored into our, our business plan. So this is another half a million dollars that we didn't have. So we then set about rebuilding the platform onto our own technology. Um, so in a sense, it almost killed us, but it also saved us because we moved off having been reliant on another company and essentially built our, uh, our own platform. And that initial architecture... It's been rewritten many times, sort of progressively, but essentially that initial architecture is still with us today and uh, we were, um, I guess, lucky that we were able to build it in that time and get past that, that particular uh, point. And then the very next thing we did was had to raise capital. Um, September 11 was our next capital raise. So we seemed to be able to pick every, <laughs> every, every capital raise we did seemed to coincide with something going wrong in the world economy. Um, and uh, we literally sent out our IM, our information mem memorandum, on the day that the, or a couple of days before the planes flew into the Twin Towers. Um, we had 17 people in the team, so it's still quite a small company. We pulled back um, to about 10 or so. Rob and I started doing everything again. Um, so we, in the early days, did everything. We brought on a... We didn't do much development, and since we brought on a pro, uh, you know, development team to, 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 to write the code, but we were intimately involved in every piece of the business. So um, we had other managers that would come on around sales, around the legal side, around the finance side. We essentially got rid of the entire management team uh, went back to running, managing everything with um, you know, a, a development team uh, alongside us. And, um, yeah, so it was a tough time. We got through that and then from that point on uh, really started to, to grow well. When that tough time hit, uh, talk through some of the reasons why you didn't give up. What were some of the signs in the business or um, even looking back when you started the business in the first 12 to 18 months, what were some of the things that happened in a positive sense that gave you the determination to, to, to go on? Yes, we were, I guess, uh, immensely positive about what we thought we could do. Uh, and this, it's such a big part of the economy. So construction is, in Australia, 7 or 8% of GDP. In developing companies, it's even a lot more than that. Um, so we fundamentally believed we could change the industry. Uh, so we had that belief. Uh, that belief was often shaken, though. We had you know, a lot of customers that would... Um, or a lot of you know, people were questioning whether we would be able to do this. Um, but we remained, so we had this firm belief that we stuck with. Um, we were pretty, I think we were good at, if there was something positive, we probably, frankly, um, overestimated the importance of those positive points. Um, but that was sort of kept us going. And we'd have one day up, one day down. I mean, it was a real roller coaster in those early days and uh, in those early years. And we, I think, got pretty good at managing the ups and downs, not getting too excited when things were going well, um, but equally not getting too down if uh, we had a bad couple of days. But literally every day could be up or down. I think the other thing is having a solid partner. Um, so Rob and I um, go way, way back before we started Aconex, um, before we were at multi well, he was at Multiplex and I was at um, McKinsey. We were in a boarding house together. Uh, so we'd known each other since we were teenagers. Uh, we actually shared a room, so um, probably knew a bit too much about each other. Uh, and um, <laughs> I won't get into any more details. Um, but, uh, uh, so we were good mates from back in the boarding house and uh, so we sort of knew each other well. I think we supported each other during that, that process. And, uh, I'd say to anybody who's founding a company, having good founders, uh, you probably don't want dozens of founders, um, maybe a couple is about right, maybe up to three, but uh, having somebody else to, that you're not alone in those tough times. I think for a single entrepreneur um, where you don't have a founding team, it's uh, perhaps much tougher. Um, I mean, I don't know, I haven't done it on my own, but I think it may be tougher to ride those ups and downs if you don't have you know, that, that person to, to work with and to keep you up when you might be down. I'll ask one more question, then uh, switch over to the audience. Um, one of the big breakthroughs in the business, as you mentioned, was uh, around this unlimited pricing or creating all the right incentives for these very, very diverse participants to all work together. Go sort of deeper into um, each different person within the construction industry and, and you know, the, the power they hold and where, who was it important to get on first and then who came second and what were the complaints of the people who came on third in, yeah. in a sort of, a, uh, you know, against their will or, you know, as a capitulation almost uh, to, to the, okay, if everything's happening here, then I'll use it. 
Yes, yeah, so we, um, I guess the first thing was we tried to service everybody in the sense we tried to keep everybody happy. So what we didn't want was uh, the architect who would just hate using the system. So one of the things we tried to do, even though we had key drivers, was to make the system um, user-friendly uh, and at least good enough that people would see it as better than what they were doing currently. So it was going to be better than paper or better than email. Uh, so we focused a lot on in enabling the different parts of the supply chain. So essentially we have everybody from, if you think about a project, you've got the owner who owns, who's developing the asset, He's paying a, a contractor who brings on a consultant team, or the owner may do that. It can be different structures. Essentially, you've got a consultant team, your architects, your engineers, and then you've got the subcontractors and the suppliers. So, kind of this pyramid of people on a project. Uh, it was pretty critical for us to get both the owner of the asset and the contractor on. They were really the two key decision makers. But then you need to have support from others. So, what we'd find, if we didn't have support of the architect or engineer, they could simply veto it um, and raise enough issues that. Um, they would stop us being engaged. So it was really important for us to make sure that the architects and the engineers were happy. So we essentially had not just a two-dimensional market, but a, you know, an n-dimensional market in terms of the number of companies that we had to get onto the, onto the, pro, onto the system. Clearly, subcontractors had a little less clout in terms of what system was being used, but if, the, if, if all the subcontractors were unhappy, it just wasn't going to work. So um, we, again, had to spend a lot of time um, with often subcontractors getting them on. Huh? And one of the things about networks, particularly the network we're working in, we really had to spend a, invest a lot in those early years, A, making the system easy to use, but also in training and support. So we used to provide unlimited service, we still do, um, where you can get as much training as you want. Uh, of course, these days, a lot of it's done online, so there's not too many customers of ours that need face-to-face -face training. But in the early days, it was all face-to-face. -face. Um, we used to do things like, um, we'd bring the subbies in, we'd get, provide them with meat pies and a beer and a stubby holder. Um, get them along, get them using the system, do anything we could to kind of get people onto the network. And um, it was a lot of, frankly, heavy lifting, a lot of going out there and doing every, you know, really working with each of these different companies to get them onto the system. But then as the network started to build, it just became much, much easier. And today, of course, um, it's uh, even easier, particularly markets like Australia, you know, international markets. Uh, we've got about 60% of our business is now offshore. Um, uh, that, you know, all those companies are already on the platform and now bringing others onto the system. So it just gets easier. As I say to our teams, is the hardest deal you ever do is the first deal in a new market. After that, you start to get this network effect that might only be small in the early days, but it starts to build for you. Um, and of course, as it gets momentum, you hit a tipping point where it all starts to swing your way. That's actually a good segue into the, the question of uh, when you decided to go outside of Australia, was it a natural uh, push from the network that you had created? Uh, when, when did you begin to think uh, more globally? So we, uh, we went global pretty early. Uh, so we went back in 2003, so we have only been operating a couple of years. We had a few of our Australian um, clients, like Multiplex, who were doing projects overseas and started to ask whether they could use a platform internationally, which was relatively easy. I mean, it was a web-based platform, so they could, they could use it. Um, but it was then how we would support it. We also <clears throat> um, saw an opportunity in London. Uh, so we, uh, we saw that there was a couple of competitors over there. Um, we thought that would be a good market to build into. So Rob Lindsay moved to London in 2003. Um, actually, over the years, we've moved into markets. We've always got you know, key people to help build our um, international markets, including Rob and myself. So I was in the US for the last four and a half years. Uh, you know, while you know, we're still running the business, um, I was over there helping drive the, the US operations. So Rob did that back in, in London. Uh, but what we found when we went there was really hard to switch people across from competitive systems. And so what that showed to us was that if we wanted to get into these other markets, we really had to plant flags early. So as early as 2005, 2006, we started opening offices in Dubai and Hong Kong um, in 2005 and then in other markets sort of after that. And uh, we then rode that massive boom in Dubai, so the crazy projects, you know, the Palm and all those sort of projects that they were doing in Dubai were huge opportunities for us. Um, so we essentially cut our teeth on the world's biggest projects in the Middle East. Um, of course, there, were, you know, there was the downturn after that, um, but we were able to ride through that. And a lot of those customers we brought on in Dubai ended up going back to their home markets. And, um, and then the US is probably our most recent market. We expanded there about six, six or seven years ago. Um, but we were quite purposeful about each market we went into. Probably one, you know, if there's one thing we got perhaps wrong, we, we, we did go into probably too many markets. Um, we found that you know, Australians love to travel, and so somebody would hop on a plane and they'd end up in Turkey, and go, oh, Turkey's a good market, why don't we set up a business here? And, um, and we probably weren't quite good enough at saying no. Um, so we, what we did essentially five, six years ago, we really didn't add a lot of new markets. We already had sort of 40-odd offices. Um, we didn't need to add more locations, so we really focused on the markets we had and actually paired it back a bit 
uh, took out some, some markets and added offices uh, in places like the US, um, continue to go deeper into those markets. But um, it was always try and get out there. If there's an opportunity, if there's big projects, try and get in on a few and then build it out and then ultimately hire local. So whenever we got into those markets, we'd try and build a local team as soon as we could. Maybe start up with a few Australians. Um, we always hired travellers as well. That was another thing. Um, we were always looking for people who travelled, who didn't mind being stuck in... I don't know, Hyderabad in a tin shed, um, waiting for their plane that's been delayed. Um, it literally happened. I had a head of customer service call up and say, my plane's been delayed. I said, where are, you, where are you? He said, I'm literally on Hyderabad tarmac um, in a tin shed, but, you know, it's OK. Uh, so you had these people who like to travel, um, and they, we tried to find those sort of people to help us build the business. Talk about how difficult it was to raise that first uh, $2 million in 2000, and who did you raise it from? And then do you think it's easier or harder to raise that round uh, in Australia now? So uh, it was probably... We probably didn't realise... Um, we, we, we were very naive, I think, um, it's fair to say, and I don't think we realised how lucky we were, frankly, to raise it. Um, we pretty quickly realised when the dot-com sort of crash happened that we may not raise any more capital, so we then made every cent last. Um, I don't think the first round was too hard. There was a lot of... Uh, People were looking at the dot-com boom and saying, oh, there's got to be opportunities here. And essentially, it was all probably a few years, as we all know today, it was a few years too early or even five or ten years too early for a lot of things that were coming out at that time. But we saw a, there was really a, a, you know, people were looking for things. Uh, they were looking to invest in things. That wasn't too bad. Um, it was that second round that was really hard. So raising after the world had gone into sort of ice age for, you know, this sort of nuclear winter for technology, uh, we, we found it really tough. Um, we were starting to get quite a bit of traction. Uh, I mean, small relative to what we do now, but it's starting to get some traction, and um, we were able to use that to raise the round, but it was tough. Um, and we looked down the barrel then of not being able to make payroll, not being able to make it through. Um, and we had a number of those incidents over the years where we got close to not making it. Um, that was probably the toughest. I think these days, um, back then there wasn't... I think the downside of the time was it was hard to raise capital, but once you got through, there wasn't that much competition. Uh, so today I think it's potentially a bit easier to raise a seed round, um, but there's a lot more competition out there. And so that's the challenge, I think, is... Uh, and I think seed rounds are, of course, a lot smaller these days, so you don't have to give up as much of the company. Uh, we essentially gave up a third of the company day one, uh, and those investors have done very well, 20 times their money, um, at least, a bit more now, 25 times their money on those first investments. So uh, they've done well, um, but, and without them, we couldn't have made it, so we're incredibly appreciative for those early round investors but we gave up a third of the company day one. Um, and we had no other option because we didn't have the money to fund it. We were, I was 26, um, Rob was, uh, well, he's slightly older, six months older, 12 months older, so... Um, but we were 26, 27, starting a business with no capital, um, so we had no choice but to do that. Uh, so I think it's probably easier in some ways these days, but more competitive. I mean, you don't have to raise as much, which is great. I think Australia is still a challenge, frankly. Uh, we raised our... We did a uh, $60 million round five, six years ago over in the US. Um, and it's really hard to raise $50, $60 million in Australia. Um, we chose to list back here because I think from a listed company point of view, Australia is great. Um, it's actually not a bad market to list. So there's, you know, the seed market is tough but doable. I think between sort of seed and being listed, it's really tough. Um, and that's where I think it's really important to be able to raise money along the way uh, internationally. Um, so thinking about that as you build your businesses, uh, <clears throat> thinking about eventually needing to raise in the US um, before going public, whether that's in the US or here, um, I think that's really important to be able to raise money along the way uh, in the US or build a business where you don't need to raise money. It's of course the other thing that if you can build a business where you don't need capital, great. Um, the more capital light you can be, the better. Um, we, of course, didn't necessarily have that luxury in the, <clears throat> in the early days, but um, over time tried to like, raise as little as we could. Um, you do, it was one quick thing on that. One of the things we did was our customers would often pay us up front. So we use our customers as a way of funding cash flow. So even though we recognise revenue over an engagement, uh, you know, over the life site, li you know, the full um, life of a deal, we essentially um, asked customers to pay us up front and gave a discount to do that. A lot of them did, so that sort of funded our growth as well over the years. <coughs> you talked about uh, the, <clears throat> the, the original premise of the company was a bad idea at the time. When will it be a good idea and what sort of signals and metrics will you look to to say, <clears throat> now is the time to buy concrete online? Yes, yeah, so um, when I look back at some of our product, as doing this, actually going back through some of our slides, some of our product roadmaps, um, we now... So we had sort of a 10, 5 to 10 step, whatever it was, product, product roadmap. Uh, what we found was a collaboration was much broader than we ever expected, so we ended up seeing a lot, you know, building out a much broader suite within collaboration. But we're now stepping onto some of the things that we originally saw as opportunities around cost management, around managing the financials on projects. 
As far as buying and selling online, I think um, it's not that far away. I mean, we're already procuring or buying a lot. As, as consumers, we buy a lot online already. So I don't think it's that much of a step for the industry to start to do that, uh, start doing that. Um, one of the challenges, of course, often that needs to go back into the accounting system. So we've spent, um, you know, since about five or six years ago, maybe a bit longer, everything we build, we build with a set of APIs around it um, so we can easily plug back into our client systems. Uh, so, when is the industry ready? Um, I think it's coming pretty quickly. Um, we're preparing for that um, and we're always ready when the industry moves. So, we invested heavily around mobility uh, four or five years ago. Uh, when the iPhone came along, we saw that as a great way of getting data to and from the construction site. Invested heavily around that. Uh, we've invested heavily around BIM, which is building information modelling. So, this is the move from 2D to 3D in the industry. Um, we spent the last couple of years um, investing around that and we'll continue to do so. Uh, so we're always looking at what are the technologies that are going to change the way people work in construction and make sure we're investing behind those. Lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Lee. Thank you.